him if you would uh, allow me the pleasure. Um, he is a globally recognized thought leader in future proofing and cognitive bias risk management. He serves as the CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts, which helps clients avoid dangerous threats and missed opportunities. He is the best selling author of seven books and is especially well known for his 2019 bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. He was published over excuse me, he has published over 550 articles and given over 450 interviews for prominent venues such as Fortune, USA Today, and Time. His internationally renowned thought leadership was translated into Chinese, Russian, Korean, and other languages. He comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, and training to hone his expertise. His clients include innovative startups, major nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his research background as a behavioral scientist with 15 years in academia. That includes seven as a professor at The Ohio State University, where he's written dozens of peer-reviewed articles. In his free time, Dr. Gleb makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. <laughs> so thank you all today and help me take advantage of this ground, his groundbreaking expertise as we welcome him to join us in presenting Returning to the Office and Managing the Delta Search, Best Practices for Association Professionals. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Gleb. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Martha. Really appreciate it. And, you know, technical difficulties are just life <laughs> nowadays. The weather was not, I mean, I'm based in Columbus, Ohio, and many of you I know are based around Ohio, Central Ohio, you know what I'm talking about. And it's going through other areas of Ohio, this unexpected storm. So this is just life nowadays. Well, let's talk about this issue of returning to the office and the Delta search, which are also part of life nowadays, and how you as association professionals can manage these issues. And you're kind of a, in a unique position. You are both deciding as an association internally, what do you do in terms of returning to the office? Do you do hybrid, full-time back in the office, full-time remote? What do, how do you collaborate together? And you're also guiding the members of your association on what to do. So you are providing them with guidance and they're looking to you for guidance. And it's your responsibility to help guide them on returning to the office, managing the Delta surge in this brave new world, in the future of work. So this is the context in which we're functioning, in which we're living right now. now You've probably heard the phrase that people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. Many leaders say this, but unfortunately, they fail to live by this principle. So this is a serious challenge in returning to the office that you need to be thinking about and aware of, that leaders may not always live by this principle, even though they say it. Leaders are very comfortable with in-office culture. It feels good. It feels right to have in-office culture for leaders. So they want to turn back the clock to January 2020. They want to turn back the clock and they often underestimate and don't realize and ignore the reality of major disruption. So I'm curious for you, if that's something that you've observed, have you observed leaders trying to turn back the clock? And that may be in your organization, that may be association, members in your association or other folks where leaders try to turn back the clock. Go ahead and vote. So you'll see that there's an opportunity to vote in the Zoom poll. Please go ahead and vote. I think maybe, I don't know if people have difficulty sharing. Let me relaunch it. So go ahead, vote for your thoughts. We have two people who responded. Great. So 75% of the people respond. I'll give five more seconds. The last person, if they wish to respond. All right. So we see that, yeah, overwhelmingly, you've all seen leaders trying to turn back the clock. And it definitely can be an issue where there's not a thoughtful approach to returning to the office. So that is something we want to address and you want to address because returning to full-time office work, which so many leaders are trying to do, can be pretty dangerous, dangerously bad for retention, recruitment, morale, productivity, work-life balance, mental health and well-being, 
and therefore your bottom line for your own association and for the members of your association. So you want to help give them that guidance as well as keep it in mind for yourself. Now, where am I getting this data? Why am I saying it's bad for all of this stuff? Well, there were eight major independent surveys done by organizations like the Harvard Business School and organizations like the Society for Human Resource Management. So major independent organizations that don't have a stake in whether you go back to the office or don't go back to the office, they just have a stake in making good decisions, providing good data for employers who are thinking about the question of going back to the office. And what they found was that over 85% of workers on average in these polls want substantial remote work. Substantial remote work. That means either full-time remote or hybrid schedules. Very few, 15% on average, want Monday through Friday back in the office. So that is something to be thinking about. Now, what about remote work? 25 to 35% in various polls want full-time remote work. So that's a very large fraction. That's a quarter to a third of your workforce who want full-time remote work. And of course, we're only talking about people who can do remote work, which is about half of the US population can do substantial remote work or full-time remote work. These are the people who worked full-time remotely during the lockdown, so they definitely can do it. Over 40%, 40 to 55% in various polls would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. So they're willing to leave their job. And we've seen people resigning in mass. In April alone of this year, about 3 million people resigning. We've been seeing this happen in the months since lots and lots of people leaving their jobs for new ones because of work arrangement issues as a major component of why they're leaving their jobs. So 70% of the people, more than 70, are less likely to leave their jobs if offered substantial remote work. So that's a part of the calculation as well. Now, another issue where the virtual work is key is for diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion. So let's talk about some surveys on this topic. There was a survey of white knowledge workers, so people who are experts, like association executives, association professionals. They're asked, do you want to return to the office full-time, part-time, or full-time remote? 20% of white knowledge workers want full-time in-office work. What about black knowledge workers? How many of them do you think want full-time remote work? Only 3%. Only 3% of black knowledge workers. You can see that this is a major, permitting virtual work and encouraging and supporting it is a major boost to diversity inclusion. Now, why is this? Because black knowledge workers and other minorities still face various forms of microaggressions and bias in remote work. And so this is a major issue for diversity inclusion as well, permitting remote work. Now, another issue I've talked about well-being Substantial work from home after COVID, according to the surveys, would make over 75% of the people happier, 70% 70 of the people look more than that, less stressed, over 75% of the people better able to manage work-life balance. So well-being, work-life balance, happiness, and productivity. So we can see both from surveys and independent research that employers are quite a bit more productive when they work at home. On average, they work 20 more hours per month. And that makes sense. You know, if you don't have to have a commute, you know, half an hour to the office, half an hour back, you work more. It's an unpaid labor. People work less because of it. So people worked more on average. So 20 hours more, that means, you know, just under five hours per week per month. And that's just a little bit under the time that it takes to commute on average. Over 75% we report higher or equal productivity. And so that is clear that people are more productive. On average, they're 10 to 14% more productive when you look at averages. And employees would take an 8% pay cut on average for substantial remote work. And that ranges from zero for people who want to go back full-time to the office, 50, you know, those 15% or so, to more than 20% pay cut for people who want full-time remote work who really want that. Now, there are some challenges in the remote work that you need to be aware of. Over 50% feel overworked, 55% experience burnout as an issue, 80% want less meetings. Biggest issues for remote work are poor virtual communication skills, that's an issue, and technology issues, which we just experienced some of those. So, with this in mind, let's take another poll. After the pandemic passed, which of these do you think would be your preferred working style? Fully remote, coming in once a quarter, one to three days in the office, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office. 
five days in office. So go ahead, please vote. See half of you voted. Let's give you five more seconds for the ones who didn't vote yet. Okay, so we see that nobody here would want full time in the office. People would want a hybrid schedule or remote. So approximately this matches with what we see. So most people want remote. So two thirds of you, one third of you want the two thirds of you want hybrid schedules, one third of you want remote, which matches generally what we see in the polls. So quite aligned. Now, there are a number of dangerous judgment errors that need to be addressed. These mental blind spots on the remote work that why leaders are making these bad decisions. The biggest one is status quo bias. Now, status quo bias, that's a cognitive bias, the dangerous judgment error. Cognitive biases are the errors we make because of how our mind is wired, our intuitions, our gut reactions. When people tell you to go with your gut, that's actually really bad advice for making decisions. And this, as you know, from my research at Ohio State, this is something that I have a lot of expertise in. This is not something you want to do. You don't want to simply go with your gut. That's a bad idea. We fall into a lot of dangerous judgment errors, systematic patterns of mistakes that cause us to harm ourselves and our organizations, our associations. So that's something you don't want to fall into. Status quo bias is one of these. We desire to maintain or get back to the status quo. So leaders who have been in the status quo in the office and they've been successful as leaders. That's how they see themselves as successful by being in the office. They've had a career of you know, 10, 20, 30 years, some 40 years in the office, and they're successful in that way, being in the office. So they want to get back to the office. They want to get back to their place of success. And they don't realize that they'll acknowledge and reject the fact that the reality changed. They're blind to the major disruptions from the pandemic. Now, another one here is called the false consensus effect. The false consensus effect, what's that about? Well, another aspect of our intuitions is tribalism. We are wired not for the modern world, we're wired for the savannah environment when we lived in tribes of 50 people to 150 people. So in that sense that tribalism causes us to feel that people who are in our in-group, in our tribe, share our beliefs, share what we feel and what we think. So leaders would tend to believe that their employees, those in their tribe, share their preferences and beliefs about going back to the office. And so many people don't actually survey their employees. I'm working for, I was consulting for a major, major group of peer executives. They have many, many thousands of peer of executives from middle market companies, middle market companies in, in, as members of that association, that organization. And so when they did a survey, which I participated in on what, how many of the executives at middle market companies, which is 100 people to 2,500 people or so, how many of them surveyed their employees and going back to the office? Well, only 44% surveyed their employees, only 44%. That's, that's very sad that they did not survey their employees. So they feel that their employees should have the same beliefs. That's incorrect beliefs that others share preferences, such as coming back to the office. And it hurts the largest companies. We're not talking about only middle market companies or you know, associations, which tend to be smaller, fewer employees, you know, 50, 100. That is not who it hurts. It hurts the largest companies. I mean, look what happened with Google. Google was for throughout the pandemic saying that after the vaccines are available, we're all going to go back to the office. For, to, we're going to the office, definitely no remote work, we're really going back to the office. Kept saying this, saying this, saying this, as vaccines were increasingly available, that they kept saying it, but their employees were really resistant. They got used to working at home. They saw that, hey, I can be fine and productive at home, don't have to come into the office, slip into the office, do this, you know, in this San Francisco Bay Area, that's not a half hour commute, that's an hour or more commute, but the one way and another hour on the way back. So that's not great. And so they started leaving Google and Google had to eventually admit its mistakes on May 5th and it turned around and said, okay, we'll let a significant proportion of our employees, 20-ish percent, work full-time remotely. So 
that cost Google many billions of dollars. I mean, it's a many, trillion plus dollar company and changing its plans, its strategy fundamentally from everyone go back to the office to a bunch of people go full-time remote and other changes really shifted things, cost them many billions. And this is something that you see in smaller companies, organizations, associations happening every day. A related problem is called the confirmation bias, where I talked about how many leaders don't look to their employees for looking for information. What they do instead is look for information that supports their beliefs. We look only for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information from our employees and so on, and major external surveys that doesn't support our beliefs. So for example, leaders at companies which I had to help shift. So I worked with 16 organizations companies, nonprofits, associations on returning back to the office, consulting for them. What I saw in a, some of these as I entered in before the intervention was that the way that they were deciding on going back to the office is that the top leader with the executive director, the CEO, would talk to the C-suite. The C-suite would talk to the senior VPs, and that's all. And that's how the conversation went. And they all decided to go back to the office. And so that is a serious, serious problem because you're only talking to people like you, to people who are successful through going back to the office. And so that is not something that it gives you actual information about what people want. So this is, doesn't show you how much damage you'll have from going, forcing people back to the office. Now, another dangerous, dangerous judgment error is called the normalcy bias. The normalcy bias. And here we're getting to the delta search. We tend to greatly underestimate the likelihood and the impact of major disruptors. So after the vaccine, this was presented to us. Many people thought that, hey, life should get back to normal. Vaccine, normal, right? That's what people perceived. And underestimated the likelihood of variants like the Delta surge. So this is a big, big problem. Still, many, many people are underestimating the Delta surge. Pfizer effectiveness against Delta, I don't know if you know this, but it's down to 39% after six months. So waning, combination of waning effectiveness and the strength of the Delta variant causes vaccines like Pfizer and so on to be much less effective. And Johnson & Johnson is even less effective than, than Pfizer. So we have Moderna and Pfizer about the same, Johnson & Johnson, even less effective than 39% after six months. This is bad. And there are new variants that are coming out, like the Delta Plus variant. It's more resistant to vaccines, just as infectious as Delta, but more resistant to vaccines. It's spreading in the Bay Area and elsewhere, 11 countries, probably in Ohio by now, although it hasn't been caught. So we need to understand that these variants will be there going forward, we will continue to face them. And so for the sake of risk management and company culture, it's really valuable to have some people go work full-time remotely, because then that will allow you to immediately, when the variant gets worse, to bring back everyone to do full-time remote work. That will be a much less of a disruption to your culture, because your culture will already include some people who work full-time remotely, and that will manage your risks really well for the people who work full-time remotely, who can take over some of the functions during the disruption of people who are hybrid Go, or people who are full-time in the office going to full-time remote work. Another cognitive bias that's really important in where people don't make good decisions about how to work in a hybrid slash fully remote schedule. It's called functional fixedness, functional fixedness. You might've heard of the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything you see looks like a nail. Well, this is kind of the same. When you have one way, one tool set, one way of collaborating, then when you perceive that there's only one way, right way of doing things, you'll tend to apply that way to all of the ways that you work together, that you collaborate, that you do things. For example, when the lockdowns happened in March, 2020, companies had a certain in-office culture and they transposed that in-office culture on remote work. So they transposed that in-office culture, Zoom happy hours, the classic example, which is not a good idea, not very helpful, but they kept doing them. And that was a big problem and many other problems where the remote work didn't work out nearly as well as it should have, wasn't nearly as productive, as engaging, as morale boosting as it could have been because companies didn't adapt strategically to remote work. So these are the five cognitive biases I wanted to highlight. And now I'm gonna ask you a question. 
which of these cognitive biases might be the most problematic choice for the return to office in your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. So you, there's occasional technical issues with the polls. You should be able to vote now. So please go ahead and vote. Which of these cognitive biases might be the most problematic for the return to the office in your workplace? Go ahead and vote. See that two thirds of you voted. I'll give you five more seconds. The first five more seconds. Okay, so we see that the normalcy bias, the underestimation of major disruptors, like the call it delta surge is a major issue for two thirds of you, for one thirds of you, it's functional fixedness. And you now the underestimation of other variants is a definitely a major issue. What's happening with the delta surge? Well, what's coming up behind it? Delta plus, other variants, we are very much underestimating those. You know, delta is supposed to peak sometime in maybe late, mid, late fall, but what's going to happen afterwards. So this is something serious to think about. And for you, especially as association executives, professionals, you need to both make decisions for yourself, your association, what you're going to do and guide your members. And this is really important for you to be thinking about as you're doing that. So how can you collaborate most effectively in this culture? The competitive advantage in the future of work for yourself as association leaders and for your association members overwhelmingly, and this includes manufacturing associations. I've helped a number of manufacturing manufacturing organizations, companies, of course, manuf manufacturers adapt to the hybrid and remote model. In fact, right now I'm working with a company that they gave me a testimonial, so I'm allowed to speak about them. It's called Applied Materials. It's number 176 in the Fortune 500 list. That is a major manufacturer with over 20,000 people and they manufacture semiconductor parts. So very important. And they have been able to adapt this hybrid first model with minority remote. So if manufacturers can do it, any company can do it, believe me. The minority of your employees, 10 to 30% will be fully remote and the majority will be spend one to three days in the office and the amount of an office work, how much does do they spend in the office, right? It should depend on the amount of collaboration they have to do. So the collaboration is the key thing that they'll do in the office. When we look at their productivity, people are way more productive on their individual tasks on average at home. So 10 to 14% and across all their tasks, even higher on their individual tasks. Their collaborative tasks, it depends. It depends on the person, depends on the team. It depends on the nature of the task. So collaborative tasks, some of them are better done in the office, some of them are better done at home, but individual tasks overwhelmingly done at home. So you want to make decisions about hybrid schedules. So people will be full-time remote, what about those hybrid schedules? The default should be one day in the office kind of for maintaining team culture, for those weekly meetings, collaboration, one day in the office, and then anything over that should be justified by additional collaboration that people have to do. So that is the best practice for returning to the office on average for, for the large majority of companies. Now, fully remote options, who is that best for? Now, teams, whole teams can decide to go fully remote and that works well. So when you have a whole team going fully remote and the team figures out that it's collaborative activities can be done fully remotely, that's great. For individuals and hybrid teams. Now, when the team decides to be hybrid, so when they're coming into the office, but some individuals on that team want two people want to be fully remote. That can work as well if people can be effective while working remotely. If they're still self-starters, if they take initiative, if they advocate for themselves within the company, within the organization, because they do have career growth issues if they don't advocate for themselves. They need to have this discipline and organization if they're gonna be working full-time remotely. In any case, you should still have team building retreats for full-time remote teams, for full-time remote staff, once per quarter. And so it'll improve social bonds, improves trust, helps teams plan their strategy. So that's a good strategy going forward. Now, as part of doing so, you want to reshape your office space. The office space of the yesterday will not be what you need for the future of work. 
you want to first get information from team leaders on how much time they plan to spend in the office. Some of them will be full-time remote. Some of them will be decide to spend one day in the office, some two days in the office, depending on the amount of collaboration. And then you want to decrease your real estate footprint and office services accordingly. Why do you need to pay for real estate if it's not occupied? Now, about 20% for most companies, most uh, organizations, about 20% of your real estate is going to be obligatory, kind of necessary payroll, stuff like that, top leadership offices, meeting spaces. And the rest, 80%, will depend on occupancy. So if you figure that after the pandemic, after everything passes, after this Delta surge and additional variants, maybe you know, in a year or two after that goes away, what will happen? Well, you know, maybe you'll have people coming in on average of one day a week. You know, some people will come in two days a week, some people will be fully virtual you know, on average of one day a week. That means you'll only need to have 20% of your previous occupancy. You can probably get rid of 50% or more of your office space and save quite a lot of money and office-based services like janitor, security, all that sort of stuff. And then you want to change your office space to be mostly collaborative. You know, people will be coming to the office not to do their individual work. They'll be doing their individual work overwhelmingly at home. They will come be coming back to the office to do collaborative work. So you need to have collaborative spaces. Right now, office spaces are mostly individual. Maybe 20% are collaborative and 80% are, are individual. You need to flip that and make it something like one third individual, two thirds collaborative with conference rooms with great video conferencing equipment because you'll have a lot of people doing video conference meetings you'll have a lot of hybrid meetings you'll want to do a lot of, of less formal spaces like lounges not a lot but you know, a lounge or two and boardrooms for small subgroups to meet and discuss things so parts of the team when people want to collaborate they want to come into the office to discuss things so you'll have want to have some boardrooms and again you know this is not simply for you as an association itself, but for your association members, the kind of guidance you will be giving them. Now, you also want to have some funding for home offices. This is an important issue. You want to use savings from real estate to fund your home offices. That is quite valuable. I mean, your home offices, think about it. The home offices of your employees will be where the majority of the work of your association takes place and of your association's members takes place. Their individual work, which is what most employees do, their individual work will mostly be done at home, overwhelmingly. So you want to make sure they have a good internet connection. <laughs> we have been having internet issues because of the storm. So you want to, you know, storms can happen, but you want to make sure they have as good internet connection as reasonable. They're good equipment, and that includes video cameras, microphones, not simply laptops. You remember, people having bad video cameras and microphones doesn't bother them. It's a problem for their team members and it's a problem for their stakeholders. It's a problem for uh, external stakeholders. If your salespeople are trying to make a sale on video camera and they are not coming uh, uh, on video conference, they're not coming through very well and they're not coming through clearly, that's bad. <laughs> you don't want that to happen. And as an association member, if you're trying to, as an association leader, if you're trying to engage an association member, whether for and having a video conference meeting with one or many, you want to make sure to come across as good as possible and that your staff come across as good as possible. So equipment is really important. Ergonomic furniture, you want people to be as productive as possible and comfortable as possible, so they're productive. So ergonomics is important. Soundproofing for those with difficulties with sounds. Room separators if they don't have a separate room and so on. So all of this stuff, funding for home offices is quite important. Now, I'm curious whether you or your team members would benefit from such funding to establish a quiet and comfortable office space and acquire technology, equipment, broadband access. You should see a poll where you should be able to vote on this topic. So please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds for those who didn't vote. Definitely seems quite popular, so great. So that seems like that would be quite useful to you. Great. Good to know, and this is some information to bring. If you're the leader of your association, this is for you to think about. And if you are not the leader of your association, this is something for you to think about bringing to the leadership, as well as, of course, informing the members of your association. 
as something that they can be doing for their employees. Now, you want to also change performance evaluation. This is not something that is often thought about, the performance evaluation, but it's really important. Right now, performance evaluation, the typical performance evaluation is one big performance evaluation based on amount of time people spend working. So, you know, that one annual review, which is assessed where the boss assesses you based on how much you worked. That is not great. You want to focus on deliverables and accomplishments and what you got done with this hybrid and remote schedule. People can't really see you working. And it, in, even previously, it's not great. It should be based on deliverables and accomplishments. So focus on productivity, focus on what you deliver, focus on your accomplishments. That's what the performance evaluation should be about. And it should switch from that one big annual evaluation to focusing on evaluating individual tasks and collaborative tasks rapidly, frequently, weekly. So something like, this is something that I've done at the over, over a dozen companies and other organizations that I helped get back to the office by now. So you want something like a report that a team member sends to their team leader every week saying here are the top three to five accomplishments for the week. Here are the kind of problems I faced. Here's how I solved them. Here's what I plan to focus on accomplishing next week. And here's my self-evaluation for the week. And then you have a 15 to 30 minute meeting with the team leader, where the team leader talks through these accomplishments, maybe coaches the team member in solving the problem better, and then addresses their addresses their what they plan to do for next week, and then approves or revises their performance evaluation. And that gets fed into a continual performance evaluation process. That's a much, much better fit for the modern world of hybrid and remote teams and something you should be really thinking about. I'm curious whether that's something that you think might be helpful for you to revise this performance evaluation. Would that be valuable for your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds for those who didn't vote yet. Great, so it seems look for the large majority of you, 75%, this would be quite valuable. And for the 25%, this would not be valuable. So that's good to hear. Excellent. Oh, and uh, I see that Adam, so I think Adam Herman meant to send that to everyone. Uh, he said that we have shifted to this model at our association with several staff and it's worked well. Good to hear that. Thank you for sharing your experience, Adam. Now, let's talk about adapting your culture. And again, this is your culture. The performance evaluation, again, is for you, for your association, and for your members to help them. The same thing applies to adapting your culture. This is for you, for, your, for your, yourself as an association, and for the members of your association to give them guidance. Again, your blogs and your webinars and your, all the content that you provide, giving them talks, provide them with this guidance on how they should return to the office. So that's really important. In your magazines, you want to replace office style bonding like Zoom happy hours with native virtual formats. This applies to people who are all virtual. So those virtual workers, you know, you have, I don't know, 10 to 30% or however many percent of your organization, your association and the organizations of your members doing virtual and for the hybrid workers as well. And this applies to everyone. So text-based warning update for hybrid workers, it's for the days that they don't come to the workplace. And for virtual workers, it's every day. So four days a week on average. For hybrid workers, five days a week for virtual workers. That's a text-based warning update where they share basically what they feel, how they're feeling, how they're, you go into a channel, like let's say you're using Microsoft Teams or Slack or Trello. You have a channel for each team that's about personal conversations. And what you do is you have an update every morning about how you're feeling, how you're doing, what your mood is, what you're going to focus on and work that day, and a fun fact about yourself or the world that other people may not know. And so that's a way that you communicate with each other and you stay human to each other. It's kind of like the equivalent of the virtual water cooler. And then you respond to at least three other people who 
who did their morning update. And then you can use that channel to chat throughout the day. So that's a virtual water cooler that keeps people connected to each other, retains its those social bonds and creates trust with team members, including people who are hired throughout the pandemic and never saw each other. Very good, much better than Zoom happy hours. Virtual collaboration, you want to collaborate effectively, digital co-working is a very good tool for that. Again, for hybrid teams that don't come to the office, the days that don't come to the office, and for virtual teams every day. What you do is you sign on to a video conference meeting, much like we're having now, but except in a meeting, not a webinar. And then what after that, what you do is you have everyone share what they plan to work on for the next hour. And then everyone turns off their microphones, leaves their speakers on, and has either their video on or off, whatever they prefer. And then you just work, and you know that other people are working on their tasks. That's really motivating. You know your team members are collaborating on the team tasks at the same time as you. More importantly, this is a time when you can ask questions about tasks that you have. This is especially helpful for junior team members who have less experience and who have more questions, or even senior team members who are want to get the feedback of their team members or who are working on unfamiliar tasks, or if they're working on a task that's within that has some relevance to another team member's domain, they can just turn on their microphone and ask and chat about the topic. It's not meant for a long work conversation. I can have a separate meeting about that, but chatting, discussing, answering questions, very helpful for team collaboration, for getting people integrated into the team and team culture. Another one is virtual mentorship. Virtual mentorship is something that has been shown to be really effective. You want someone from inside the team for people who are junior staff members who've been in the company or the association for three to five years, for less than three to five years, depending on how quickly it takes to integrate people at your organization. So three years, that's pretty frequent. So you want these people to have a virtual mentor from inside the team to help them integrate into the team, answer questions and so on. And you want a couple of people from outside the team, one from a different team in the same business unit and one from a different business unit. Depends, of course, I mean, if you're an association that don't, don't have that many staff, but you want someone, at least one person from outside their team. Now, for larger companies like the applied materials that I mentioned, someone from a, two people, one from a different business unit, one from the same business unit, but different team. And why is that helpful? Well, one of the things that people lose out on in hybrid and remote teams is connections across the company, across the organization. So those cross-functional collaboration suffers. So in order to address that, virtual mentors are very helpful. Then virtual innovation. So this is an important area, somewhat a little bit less so for associations, but a lot for your members, I'm guessing. So one of these is brainstorming. One of the reasons that leaders often tell me that they don't, that they want to go back to the office is that they have trouble innovating. Virtual innovation is so important, and they want they have trouble innovating effectively in virtual settings. And I ask them about it, and they tell me that, how are you doing virtual innovation? How, how are you doing that? And they tell me that they apply the same methods that they used to in their traditional settings, such as brainstorming. That just does not work well. What you want to do instead is do much more intentional brainstorming, because the yeah video conference brainstorming, traditional brainstorming just doesn't work well. What you need to do instead is have people separately generate ideas and send them to a shared document. And then everyone looks at each other's ideas, rates and evaluates their ideas, and then revises their ideas, shares them to the document, again, not at the same time, and then raises, rates and revises the, their revised ideas. And then finally, you have a meeting to discuss things. That works so much better. And there's a lot of research about this. And I'll send you more materials in a book about this topic. How do you return to the office effectively? So this is a very good tool. Another one is a channel for serendipity. Serendipitous innovation is another area that folks really miss out on. They miss out on hallway conversations, say, well, that's why we need to go back to the office but they haven't tried doing serendipitous innovation in their virtual settings. So in Microsoft Teams, if you do that, set up an innovation ideas channel for your team and for your business unit and for your whole organization, depending on how large the organization is. Then when you have ideas, just share them there. And then I can guarantee to you from what I've observed, other people will comment and they'll build in them and they will snowball if it's a good enough idea. And then you go to intentional brainstorming. This solves the innovation problem. And this is going to be very useful for you, not simply for associations, but for your members. Finally, address diversity inclusion concerns. I talked about 
diversity, equity, inclusion concerns, I talked about those white knowledge workers versus black knowledge workers. You want to make sure to provide effective training on diversity inclusion in virtual formats, because there's some digital discrimination that's going on and interruptions and in privilege that's going on as well. So that's an issue to be thinking about. All right. Gleb, um, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A that I wanted to make sure that we addressed before we got too far. Okay. Uh, the first one is, what if a leader understands that their staff wants hybrid options, but their board of directors are pushing for back in the office work? What mm. methods would you provide in that situation? Mm -hmm. What I would recommend in that sort of situation is to tell their leadership the board. And I understand the board of directors tends to be traditional. So it tends to be more conservative, but just how the boards of directors are. And you want to understand why they are pushing for back to the office work. So there's num there can be a number of reasons and you want to find out their motivations. Now, if their motivations are, well, this is just the way we do it around here. <laughs> That's kind of the status quo bias. That will probably not, they will probably not necessarily want to share that. So the answers that I'm providing, that they will tend to say things like, well, there's not sufficient collaboration. Maybe we're concerned about company culture. We're concerned about innovation. Those are the kinds of things that I've heard. And the answers I'm giving through this process is addressing the concerns of folks who want their, to go back to the office full time. So that's the kind of things that I would recommend and encourage. You want to address their specific concerns. You want to understand their concerns. You want to address their concerns. And you want to highlight why you want your to go back to the office. You want to go back to the office in the hybrid format, not full time. And uh, you want to go back to the office in hybrid format, obviously, because you want to retain your staff. Retention, recruitment, morale engagement, you know, looking at these surveys, giving them the surveys showing, look, I want to make sure that we retain these staff. Right now, employees are leaving. So let's talk about how we can make this work and what are the reasons that why you want people to go back to the office. That's what I would say. That's very good. The second question we have is, how do you address side texting or messaging during virtual meetings or staff huddles? It is obvious at times and disruptive to leadership. What I would talk about, so one of the things that we've seen and I, the surveys are indicating is that people want less meetings and they're troubled by meetings, these virtual meetings. So you want to understand what is going on that is causing these side huddles, these problems, for the for the members why are they not engaged why are they disengaged it might be the case that they're feeling too much meetings too much troubles the performance evaluation having those 15 to 30 me minute meetings that addresses i've seen that address a lot of the troubles that the typical team meetings have so that's a big big issue so if you're going to who have fully, we're talking about fully remote people because obviously we're not talking about here about those hybrid and meeting where you meet once a week inside the office. So fully remote people, the decreasing those team meetings, increasing those meetings directly with the team leader has been really helpful for addressing those side conversations and for addressing those problems. Because the reasons why team leaders want to have those weekly meetings or even more frequent than weekly is because they feel it's really important for their culture to have people integrated together. But if you have those meetings one-on-one -on -one with team members, you address a lot of their concerns and we still keep them integrated into the culture and engaged, and you keep them integrated with each other and collaborating with each other through those digital co-working and through those virtual water coolers and virtual mentorship. So you address the problems in a different way. You want to figure out what is the strategy that will address the underlying problems. Thank you. We did have one more question come in. Um, it says, can you please offer some examples of DE&I concerns with virtual mm -hmm. work and possibly paths for additional training and development sessions like this one on that specific topic? Sure. And this is, again, something I've worked on with a number of companies and organizations and associations on addressing DEI issues. Now, the DEI issues that I've seen is things like privilege, where minorities, and by minorities, people with minority positions, including in this case, there's a lot of research showing that women tend to get interrupted more than men. Black people tend to get interrupted more than white men, white people, and all of those sorts of things. That is one position, one 
form of microaggression that has been really problematic and disengaging and upsetting for people who are minorities, for diversity inclusion. And that's something that can be trained and addressed and monitored. What are interruptions happening? Who is being interrupted? How often is it happening? So you want to track those sorts of things, what's happening, what's going on, and so on. And there are other forms of digital discrimination where people are ignored, where people who are in minority positions send messages, and those messages are ignored. Or they're expected to be connected on at work for longer than people who are majority white male positions. So those are the kinds of expectations and the kinds of discriminatory responses that you see. So you want to track that and those things are trackable. Again, response to, response to messages, expectations, differences between minorities and those who are not minorities. Those things, again, are addressable, trackable, but that's the key thing. So you want to learn about the kind of digital discrimination that takes place. There's a lot of research on that. And you want to learn about the kind of effective practices that are to address that, which involves monitoring these things and addressing them if you see that they're happening. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you for addressing that, Martha. All right, let's talk about providing training. So you want to make sure that you provide training and digital discrimination training is definitely one of these trainings. And that's part of this training. Another part of training is effective hybrid work. What do you do at home? What to focus on in the office? So people are not used to doing hybrid work. They're used to doing either full-time virtual work during the pandemic or before that full-time in-office work. They're not used to this balance of hybrid and in-office work. So you want to train them on what it means to work effectively in a hybrid setting. You want to train them on effective virtual communication. Right now we're communicating, but people are... You know, I, I still feel shocked by how little resources companies and organizations and associations are spending on effective communication in virtual formats. Because of course, there was quite a bit of resources spent on effective communication before the pandemic. And virtual communication is very different than in-person communication. And that's very few resources are being spent on. And I think this is a huge, huge opportunity to address this issue. And the same thing for collaboration. So many resources spent on effective teamwork before the pandemic, but effective collaboration in virtual settings is very different and you need to know how to do that effectively. All right, key takeaways. So here are the things you wanna be thinking about. Again, this is for yourself as an association and for the members who you'll be conveying this information to. Most workers want a hybrid space, want hybrid work large majority do want fully remote and they're willing to quit. Many are willing to quit if they don't get their desired work arrangements. So that's an issue to bring up to the board of directors, for example. Cognitive biases, the ones we talked about, really cause a lot of problems for decision-making and risk management on returning to the office. The best practice for returning to the office is team-led hybrid first model with some staff being fully remote. And you need to adapt your culture to seize this competitive advantage in the future of work. So these are the things you want to be thinking about and conveying both to the other folks in your association and the members. So staffers to your association and the members. Now you'll get some free additional resources after this presentation. My best-selling book called Returning to Office, Benchmarking to Best Practices for Competitive Advantage and Free Coaching Session. So I have free coaching, free slots available for the first three claimants. So you'll get an email, you click on that. If it's available to click on and schedule, you still have that schedule, you, you still have that session. All right. I'll be happy to take any more questions right now. Oh, you're very well. You're very welcome, Sherry. I'm glad that, that was helpful. You're welcome, Elizabeth. I don't see any more questions coming in. Gleb, thank you so much. This was very interesting. And frankly, it was more informative, interesting than I expected. I got more out of it than I thought. I thought I knew things already. Um, so it was really helpful to get some new insight and some new thought processes to, to move ahead through these <laughs> interesting yes. uh, times in the office. So uh, we appreciate your time very greatly. And um, as always, it's very good to see you. Thank you, Martha. I appreciate it. And you have a great day. And everyone else, have a great day. Glad it was helpful. Thank You're you. welcome, Adam. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye.